If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. Comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliates or sponsors. Hello and welcome to another edition of The More Show, which is sponsored by the UFO Matrix magazine. On today's show, I'm about to be joined with my guest Lionel Fanthorpe. Now, Lionel was born in England and has worked as a journalist and teacher. He is currently Director of Media Studies at Cardiff Academy and is a fully ordained Anglian priest, working part-time and unpaid for the church in Wales. Lionel is President for the Association of Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena and is also the President of BUFA, the British UFO Research Association. He's now a popular TV and radio presenter and celebrity guest on chat shows. Lionel was the author of over 250 books. Lionel Fanthorpe, welcome to the show. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Now, just tell us a bit about your background to begin with. Well, I was born in Norfolk, and I think a little bit of my accent still comes through, despite 30 years in Cardiff, which I love. And uh, I hope one day that the Welsh Assembly will provide for naturalisation papers, because I'd love to become a naturalised Cardiffian. <laughs> and uh, I went from Norfolk uh, over to Cambridge. I went from Cambridge down to Essex, where I worked for a big timber company. I was their training manager. Uh, I came back from there, back into state education. I was a deputy head in Norfolk for a while. And then I got the uh, invited over to Cardiff to be headmaster of Glinderu High School in Ely. Perhaps I would just explain um, how I became a priest, and I'm an independent, um, ordained Anglican priest. Yeah. And one of the young students in my school was killed in a terrible accident in a food warehouse where he was helping out, and he was riding on the top of a forklift truck. The driver didn't remember there was a boy on the top. Went through a doorway, killed him. And obviously, as his headmaster, because your students are your friends, and you, I went round to see his family. Spent as much time as I felt was helping, and uh, just tried to share with them my own absolute faith that this life is only the beginning, that there is another world. I was only a layman in those days. and As I was coming away, the dead boy's sister came to the door with me and said, I don't know what you've done for my mother, but she's calmer now than she has been since Peter was killed. And I felt this was the most important thing that anyone could do if you could help someone. I thought of my own teenage kids and how that poor woman must be suffering at the death of her son. And I thought, well, if I've been able to do some good for this family. Maybe if I was a priest, I would be called upon to help other bereaved families. Yeah. So I tried, it's like doing an external degree. You do a three-year training course. And uh, I said, I've finished up as an ordained Anglican priest. And, uh, very happy to, to be one. I'm also a, a member of the International ULC, which is a interdenominational church with its base in America. There's 18 or 20 million members there worldwide. And so uh, between the two, I do my best to help out when I'm needed, when somebody calls on me. So you always had an understanding that life continues? Yes, I've, I've always felt that there has to be more to it. If the whole universe is to make sense, there has got to be more to it than what we can see in the here and the now and the work and the house and the family and the friends and the having a game of darts and a pint or uh, getting into the ring and having a, a contest. There has to be more than that. And when you see this huge problem that has wrecked the faith of so many thinking people, 
what we might call God and human suffering, that I had to think my way through it, that for me personally, unless there is something on the other side to put right the awful tragedies, the illness, the accident, the disability that so many good people suffer, then the whole universe is incomprehensible. And I would rather live in a universe I can comprehend, even if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm convinced that things are put right on the other side of the grave. Yeah, you've tried to make sense of it in your way of thinking, and I totally agree with everything you've just said there, and uh, I believe that life carries on as well. How it carries on, um, maybe it's much like this, who knows? I think it may well be. I'd love to tell our listeners a, a story that helped me more than anything else, and I taught in Cambridgeshire with a very great pal called Billy Farrer, and Bill and I wrote a book together, and we went everywhere together. We were like brothers. After I'd come to Cardiff, and after I was working as a priest, I got a phone call from Bill to say that he'd just been diagnosed with something terminal, and would I go and see him? So I went over to Cambridge to see him, and as often as I could, and then I got a phone call from his village priest, Father Ian, who said, ever so sorry, Lionel, Billy's just passed over. He wanted you to do the funeral for him. Will you come and do it? My church, and we lay him to rest in my cemetery. So I drove over the night before the funeral, and it was about midnight after I'd done a day's work in Cardiff, and I sat there, one end of the couch, Father Ian at the other, we had our prayer books out, sheet of notepaper, and I'll do this piece, would you like to read that bit, and then I'll read this. And suddenly, and I'm not psychic, I'm a very ordinary, practical, pragmatic sort of guy, I was absolutely certain that Billy was standing behind the couch. I could see him as clearly as you'd see a friend who walked into a room at a party. He looked 30 years younger. He was in his prime again. He was radiant with health and happiness. Wonderful smile. And he gave me the most strange, inexplicable message. He said, Lionel, tell Ian, the other priest, that Lady Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. And then he faded from the room. And I thought, I'm going to sound as if I'm coming off the wall. I've only just met Father Ian. I said, Ian, I know this is going to sound impossible, but Billy has just asked me to tell you Lady Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. And I'd expected him just to shrug and say, sorry, mate, I don't know what that means. But he didn't. He turned pale, he moved back, and... He said in a hoarse whisper, you can't have known that. And of course, I, I am now all agog. I said, Ian, please explain. Yeah. What can't I have known? And he said, I was with Billy in intensive care as he took his last few breaths. I was holding his hand, and the last thing I said to him was, Billy, hold on to this. There was a saint named Juliana who lived and worked in Norwich round about the year 1400. She had a vision of heaven, went into a trance, and the other nuns were round her, afraid that she was going to fall. And when she recovered herself, they all asked, Juliana, are you all right? What happened? And Juliana said, I have had a vision of heaven. It was as if my soul had left my body and I'd glimpsed heaven. And of course, everyone said, what is it like? What's heaven like? And Juliana said, in the rather quaint prose of the 1400s, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. And Ian looked at me and said, and you've just come 300 miles to tell me that Billy said, oh, by the way, Ian, 
I'm there, and Juliana was right. It's wonderful. It's happiness beyond words. Now, I can't explain it. I believe that Billy really did come, and he had a wonderful sense of humour. And to have asked me to say that to the other priest who had said it to him. Yeah. And I think he had already foreseen what Ian's response was going to be in the nicest way. And there was a sequel to this. As I was driving home following morning, after we had done the service and laid Billy to rest in this little village churchyard, as I was driving back to Cardiff along the M4, on that stretch where the notices are up saying, beware of the deer, I was in the middle lane and a huge Arctic with a trailer I was overtaking him at about 55, nothing silly. And suddenly he pulled out and hit my back wheel. And I spun around, I was driving a Granada in those days, and I spun around, he got me pinned on his front bumper and we were going down the road sideways. And I thought, any minute she's going to roll and I'm dead. And then it was as if there was another pair of hands on the wheel doing things. Now, I'm primarily a biker. Um, I ride a car, so I drive a car safely, but bike is my number yeah, one Yeah, bike's, bike's your thing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Billy, on the other hand, was so good as a car driver that he could have been another Schumacher. If he'd wanted to take up racing instead of teaching, he would have been outstanding. And I couldn't help thinking that somebody who was much better with a car than I am was doing almost magical things to get us off that bumper and we came clear and we went over the hard shoulder over a ditch over a hedge car was right off and I did not have a scratch I had no whiplash nothing I kicked my way out and I couldn't help looking up and saying Billy was that your first job as my guardian angel and those are two episodes that I shall remember as long as I live and they are things that convince me that there is another world and that those who've been our loved ones and our best friends in this world I think they have a role as guardian angels they they do things for us and we can all think of a moment when we've been in danger or when something has been a near miss and you you think to yourself, now, why did I do that and avoid the danger? Was there someone invisible who was taking care of me? Yeah. So, um, I think that love transcends death. And I think that when two good friends or two loving partners have been very close in this world, then that closeness and that love continues. Love is the essence of heaven. That's a lovely way of putting it, yeah, yeah. So, um, d do your views fit in with the um, the Anglian Church, though? I mean, you, you've written all these paranormal books, and obviously they must know of your work. Um, is this a modern kind of church you're with, or...? No, I'm I'm sort of totally independent. I'm, uh, uh, what should we say, I'm one of these guys who, when he's made his mind up, likes to go his own way, and I'm, I'm not particularly amenable to bureaucratic regulations and if I think something is right I, <laughs> uh, I'm sort of sufficiently stubborn to go ahead and do it now I'm uh, I'm not particularly close to the church hierarchy <laughs> I think they probably wish I was a Muslim yes yeah, so you, you, you basically you've as long as it feels right, you'll go with it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's almost like the, uh, although I said I'm an ordained Anglican, uh, I feel very much in sympathy with the Quakers who believe in the inner light. And uh, if a Quaker is making up his mind on a moral issue or a behavioural issue, uh, he will say, I'm going to wait for the guidance. If my conscience tells me I'm doing the right thing, I will do it. I don't need regulations. That's the best way to be, Lionel. Uh, well, I think so, and I'm, I'm glad you feel the same, Gav. <laughs> Definitely. I have only, only more people, you know, trusted themselves to go with their, with their feelings and yeah. with, with what their heart tells them to do. Absolutely, and I think that this is what, this is what you have to do. And I can 
remember the most important thing in my life is the uh, 53 years of wonderfully happy marriage that Patricia and I have had. We married in 57. And when you've got a partner like her, you tend to say to her from time to time, you know, I love you more than my own life. And just once in the last 53 years, I had an opportunity to sort of, you know, kind of put that into practice. It's one thing to to put it in words and to feel it. And then you don't want these occasions to happen, but we were uh, in a boat in Mahon Bay, Nova Scotia. We were investigating the Oak Island mystery, which is one of the mysteries that we write about. Oh, I've heard of this, There's yes. a famous money pit on Oak Island. And for the last 200 and more years, nobody has succeeded in solving the problem of what is down there or who put it there because of the flood water in the labyrinth under the island. And the guy who was uh, renting the boat to us suddenly said, uh-oh, I've got salt water in the diesel pipe. And the boat, needless to say, stopped. <laughs> and we got um, sort of 45 degree waves pushing at it and Patricia doesn't swim and uh, I do it sort of I think it, it goes with the martial arts and the weight training I love swimming and um, I said to her look kid if and when this thing goes over you just grab both sides of my shirt yeah and if I can't get you out I am not going well I'm here to tell the story so we uh, we got out <laughs> but uh, it's the kind of thing when you and I were talking about the importance of love, the importance of doing what you believe to be right, at that moment, this lovely partner of mine, I thought, well, if I, if I can't get her out, I'm not going. I don't want to, I don't want to go anywhere without no. her. And uh, as I said, I'm, it has a happy ending. I'm here to tell the tale. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And thank and God for that, yeah, eh? And we're both here. <laughs> we're both here. And looking forward to the next 53 exactly, years. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, <coughs> tell us, uh, Lionel, what's your, uh, what's your latest projects? Well, the thing I've been working on most recently uh, has been a UK Supernatural Angel Report. And that was specially commissioned to celebrate the release of... Supernatural, the complete season five DVD. It's just out now. It's out on Blu-ray. And the reason that the uh, commissioners wanted uh, an angel report uh, was because there are angels in the show. It's one of those battles between good and evil, a very exciting thing with the Winchester brothers versus the devil and getting a bit of help from the angels. And that's available to buy now, yeah. Yeah, they're they're out they're they're out now, and it's uh, it's one I would honestly recommend if you like that kind of supernatural thriller. Right. Well, we'll definitely put a link on our website to that uh, box set on Amazon. I would think it would be available. Yeah, it would be available from Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, uh, moving on just slightly here, um, tell us about your big book of mysteries and uh, and how that came about. Well, we've been working for a company called Dundurn who were over in Toronto. And uh, over the last 10, 12 years, we've written 15 or 16 real-life unsolved mystery books for them. And what they have done recently is to start putting together... For example, if you were writing detective fiction or if you were writing shall we say, horror fiction or some science fiction, if you were one of the author team and you were producing a particular genre and your books had been going well for them over the last five, ten years, they would then ask you to put together a sort of compendium, an anthology of, we'll say, your detective stories or your horror stories or whatever you I see. specialize okay. in. Yeah. And because Patricia and I have been all around the world on a number of occasions investigating unsolved mysteries on site, which was what we were doing over in Nova Scotia when we down nearly drowned, um, they asked us if we would put from the 15 or 16 books that we've written, if we would select a particular mystery from from one, from another, from another, and put them together into the... It's really a big coffee table book, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed 
going through all the work we'd been doing over the last 15 or 16 years and uh, putting together the ones that had intrigued us yeah. the most. Yeah, I mean, I bet there's some stories in there. Well, we've, uh, for instance, the, the, the Renle Chateau mystery is one that's intrigued us for years. And long before Dan Brown made his millions with uh, his versions of the Da Vinci Code, which centers on the Renle Chateau mystery, uh, we were there in 1975 when it started. Incredible. And I was doing a series uh, of lectures for Cambridge University's extramural board on the psychology and sociology of unexplained mysteries. And we were trying to bring in the the strange reason why when dozens of ships vanished and crews vanished, why was it that the Mary Celeste was selected as the mystery ship? And we looked at other mysteries where there were reports of vampires or werewolves or all sorts of odd beasties and things that go bump in the night. And we were trying to find out in this academic course at Cambridge why certain mysteries had appealed more than others and been selected and categorised. And the, the, the course had been very successful and... Uh, students were kind enough to say they'd like another term and then another term and we were running out of mysteries and then we heard about this uh, documentary that Henry Lincoln had made called The Priest, The Painter and The Devil which is what started the upsurge of interest in the Renle Chateau story and so we uh, took the kids who were then very small over to stay with mother who loved having them you know there's no, there's, there's no better present for a loving grandparent than to be entrusted with the kids for a few days. I, I can believe that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we we then set off for Renle Chateau. And uh, when we got down there, we found that it was an even bigger mystery than Henry Lincoln. Henry Lincoln did very well with his documentary, and he made it intriguing, but the actual mystery itself, when you got there, it was a bit like Doctor Who's TARDIS. You opened it, and it was a heck of a lot bigger on the inside than it was from the outside. The outside was a priest named Berenger Saunier had suddenly become the richest man in the south of France in 1885. Nobody knew where the money had come from. And then, of course, from that... All the mystery of the bloodline, was Jesus married to Mary Magdalene? And had they had children, had Mary gone to France with the children under the guardianship of Joseph of Arimathea? And had those children eventually married into the Merovingian French dynasty? And was this bloodline still running? This was one of the major mysteries. And then, of course, there was the the possibility that Saunier had discovered some very ancient, priceless holy relic, something like the crown of St. Stephen. I mean, it wasn't that, because we know where that is. But uh, had he got the grail? Had he found the lance of Longinus, you know, the, the spear of destiny? And if so, what had happened to it? And then it tied in with the Templars and uh, with the... Um, all sorts of other strange and mysterious groups uh, that were down there. And we just found one mystery after another, and every time you got halfway towards solving one of them, you just hit another. Um, one of them was the unsolved murder mystery of a, a priest who had been at the neighbouring village who had been terrified of something or someone and who had only unbolted his door when his niece brought him food and his clean laundry and collected his dirty laundry. And she was instructed to remain on that doorstep until she had heard the bolts go home. Now, in spite of all those precautions, somebody got into the presbytery, hit him first with the fire irons, and finished him with an axe as he had tried to struggle to the window to shout for help. Antoine Gélis, his name, and 
whether Beranger Sonnier had actually killed him is part of the the depth of that unsolved mystery. And so from one mystery to another, there's also the strange behavior of the priest who went to take Sonnier's deathbed confession in 1917, in January. Sonnier lay mortally ill and he said something to this young priest that terrified the boy out of his wits because he ran from the sick room and was had a nervous breakdown. He didn't absolve Sonia, and he was too ill, shocked, desperate to work for three months. The bishop gave him three months off to recover. So what did Sonia say to him? Oh, by the way, I murdered Father Jalis. Oh, and another thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a friend who was a real expert in the old religion and uh, witchcraft of various kinds. She said that one of her colleagues, having been to a lecture that I'd given on the Sonia mystery, she'd relayed this to one of her colleagues who was even more knowledgeable than she was, and that he was of the opinion that what Sonia had been up to to make all this money was that he was performing a very curious ritual known as the Convocation of Venus, which requires a nubile young lady to copulate with on the altar. Uh, of course, Venus being the, the sex goddess. And it was his opinion that this actually worked. Whatever magic lay within it, whatever magic is, it had enabled Sonia to make accurate predictions. And by selling the accurate predictions that were the product of the convocation of Venus, he had a beautiful little 18-year-old housekeeper when he was in his 40s, and uh, she was evidently his girlfriend as yeah. well as the housekeeper. And uh, one of the theories was that um, Sonia on his deathbed, her name was Marie Dernano, and Sonia on his deathbed had said to poor young father Riviere, who was rather an inexperienced young priest. Oh, by the way, I was performing a black magic ritual on the altar in the church with Marie. Now, to a young celibate priest with intense feelings, I think that could have, if he'd added the murder to it, this could well have been why the guy ran in terror from the room. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 uh, it possible. I suppose only time will tell. I suppose maybe one yeah, day that keep investigating. Keep investigating. Yeah. yeah, but it's an amazing mystery. Oh, it sounds incredible. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, um, you know, people love a scary story, and uh, you've obviously got the, lots of uh, scary stories in, in your work. Um, just tell the audience a bit about some exorcist case that you've. Uh, Dealt with. Right, well, one of the strangest was in a particularly strange place, and it was in the Odeon Cinema in Bristol. And a young man there who was one of the ushers and, you know, staff member in the cinema uh, had given up his job because he said there were evil presences there that were attacking him, and he was hypersensitive to their presence. So I took with me one of the best and most honest psychic um, mediums. I have a Bremner Howells, who's a great friend of mine, and uh, was a lady with both a law degree and a nursing qualification, so she's you know, intellectually very sound and very sensible and very practical. And if she tells me that she can see or hear something strange, I am very much inclined to go along with the genuineness of her report. So she came with me to um, exorcise the area of the cinema where this young man, his manager was very kind to him and said, look, if you can bring a priest with you to exorcise whatever's there, you're very welcome. Come in and we say we can help you. And hoping that the young man would then take his job back. And we were going down the corridor because this is where he had been most troubled behind the actual auditorium. And Bremner, I said, my medium friend, said, there is something very evil, something very negative in this place. And as we came to the spot where the young man had previously experienced the, the worst of what had frightened him out of his job, 
he slithered down the wall, put his back to the wall and just went slowly down onto the floor, assumed a sort of fetal position with his hands over his stomach and said, they're attacking me, they're all over me, they're hurting me. And Bremner said, I can see them. And she thought for a moment and then said, the nearest I can get to describing them it's as if they were like psychic piranha fish swarming at him and attacking him physically. Now, I couldn't see anything. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, could you not see? No, no. Not, not a thing. Oh. Not a thing. And the thing I could detect, there was a really foul smell, like decay and death. And I have, although I'm not psychic, I have on occasion experienced fragrance, perfume, in um, a psychic situation. I've heard of this. This yeah. is quite common, isn't it? Yeah. It is. At Flankayak Vower, as an example, there's a very benign and quite lovable spirit who is um, the, the, the psychic entity from a very lovable housekeeper who treated her family, uh, the family she worked for, as if they were her family. She was more of a family member and friend than a servant. And she walked up from the kitchen to the family dining room. And it was her regular route to take meals and drinks to the family that she loved and looked after. And I was exploring there one day with a great friend of mine, Robert Snow, who was then the secretary of the Ghost Club and had done a lot of investigating, as I have. And both of us were on this spiral staircase from the kitchen to the dining room when Rob said, Lionel, I can smell lavender. And, of course, the ladies in the 17th century would douse themselves with lavender perfume because people didn't wash quite as frequently as we do in yeah. the 21st century. And if you're at a party or in a crowded room and somebody is wearing a very strong aftershave and they come towards your part of the room and then pass you, you get the aftershave getting stronger and then getting weaker. And this was what Rob and I experienced with the lavender perfume. It was as if a lady who was wearing very strong lavender was climbing up the staircase past us on her way up to look after the family. Now, this is the way, you know, that it can work, this olfactory sensation of something psychic. And the the fragrance there, fragrance isn't the right word, but the odour was of death and decay, and it was appalling. When I was in France not long after the war, I was with a friend, and he suddenly took his handkerchief out and motioned to me to do the same. He clapped it over his nose and mouth. And the builders were demolishing a house that had been there since the bombs had dropped on it, and they had just uncovered some bodies of victims who died in that air raid. And it went the length of the street, and it was just indescribable. And for my young French friend, the it, it was an experience that you knew immediately you saw builders at work, you went for something to protect your nose and mouth. And the smell in the corridor in the cinema was like the smell of death from that building in France that I'd experienced years before. And Bremner, my medium friend, pointed to where she could see these things that I certainly couldn't. And I, in the course of an exorcism, you use holy water, and I sprinkled the holy water. And I also used prayer that I find most effective in an exorcism is a prayer that's attributed to St. Columba. And Columba was by the shore of Loch Ness centuries ago. And a poor fisherman who couldn't swim, had lost his boat. It was drifting across the lock, and it was the man's livelihood. Columba had a brave young monk with him, strong young man, and he said, can you get that? Yes, he said, of course. 
and the powerful young monk swam towards the boat and according to the story the Loch Ness monster appeared and swam towards the monk. Columba himself raced into the water and used this prayer. In the name of God, touch not thou that man, be gone! And the monster, whether it was just the power in Columba's voice or whether it was the magic of his prayer, but the monster turned and swam off in the other direction. The young man saved the boat and brought it back to the fisherman. Now, I use that same prayer. In the name of God, be gone. Touch not thou that man. And I was sprinkling holy water where Bremner was telling me, that's where they are, Lionel, that's where they are. And she said, as I'd sprinkled the holy water and said Columbus prayer, she said, they're going. They are terrified. Not of me, but of the holy water and of the prayer. It wasn't that uh, uh, I had any strange powers. I was simply conducting the divine power. I often think that when you are an exorcist and when you're blessing a place that's been cursed or that has problems associated with it of a paranormal nature, that uh, I think of myself as a, a rather worn old garden hose pipe, but I can still convey the water that the plants need. And uh, I think any exorcist does simply that. And when the exorcism is successful, you have been rather like the hose pipe or the barrel of the gun that carries the divine shot yeah. into the evil entity. Yeah. And the boy stood up and his whole expression changed, the pain gone from his face. He said, I feel better. They've gone. And again, the only thing that I was aware of was the change in scent. And from that reeking odor of death and decay and pure evil, there was a wonderful fragrance like pine disinfectant. It was as though you were standing in a lovely pine forest at the lower slopes of a, a mountain and just breathing in that pure forest air. And that was one of the, the strangest exorcisms, one of the, shall we say, the most dramatic exorcism in which I've ever been involved out of the many that I've done over the last half century. So, so normally they're a bit calmer than that. This was, would you say, an extreme case? An extreme case. There was something... Now, we then checked to see if there was any history associated with that cinema. And apparently, not long after the end of the Second World War, when troops were returning from postings overseas, the, cine the cinema manager had been shot dead. Apparently someone had just opened his office door, fired a couple of rounds into him, and went. Never solved. Now, it appeared that the motive for that shooting was that cinema manager had been, uh, what should we say, making the most of his opportunities with the lonely young wives of the servicemen overseas and he had a uh, a very unpleasant reputation for exploiting these lonely girls and it looked as if somebody had found out or perhaps a poor young wife had confessed to a returning officer yeah, yeah. and uh, he fully understanding her forgiving her without any problems and you know, I'm going to do something about him. And uh, it was in, open the door, and bang, bang. And of course, the um, situation at the end of the war, guys were coming back, these were heroes, these were men who'd risked their lives over and over. And customs officers were not very, um, not very demanding about what have you got in that briefcase and some of the things in, in the, uh, you know, in your knapsack and some of the things in that case 
could well have been a nice little 9mm German Luger that he'd taken from a, a German soldier in single combat. And uh, again, if I was a customs officer and I had been uh, welcoming home some soldiers, I would not have you haven't got anything in there to declare, have you, son? No, OK, next. Yeah, go through, son, go through. And it's just the gratitude that these guys were risking their lives for. You're not going to be bureaucratic with them. Yeah. So there were a lot of, uh, shall we say, unofficial weapons yeah. around in 45 and 46. And uh, it seemed to make the opportunity. So how many exorcism cases would you say you deal with in a year? Probably on average three or four. It's they're not that frequent. Probably three to four, maybe five. Um, one recent one, almost within a stone's throw of our studio, uh, a few years ago, there were two young ladies came to our church. I was then working in Saint German's Church, um, and my colleague was a lovely guy, but very traditional and wouldn't have wanted to get involved in exorcism or anything of the paranormal and when these two young ladies turned up asking for help he gave me a smile and said i rather think this is your department i said certainly father i'll deal with it and uh, they were living in a house in adamstown and when they came home they were both single parent mums and when they came home with the children very often they would see the outline of a figure in Victorian bonnet and uh, cape, an elderly lady by the look of her, sitting in the upstairs flat. And with great courage, commendable courage, uh, the two young mums went upstairs to see who that was or what it was. When they got up there, no one there, nothing there. But they then heard footsteps downstairs. It was as if the entity had moved to the other flat as they were going up to investigate. And when I called round to see them in response to their request, uh, I blessed them and I blessed the children to protect them as individuals. And uh, I then, again, used holy water and exorcised the building and... That was a, a completely quiet, calm, gentle... There was nothing evil there. It was almost as if the, the spirit of the old lady had just come back to a place that she'd known in life. Of course, one of the theories about the different kinds of psychic phenomena, which are reported by good, honest witnesses, there seem to be recordings, just as professionally... We can use either a, a DVD or a CD or any other kind of videotape, any kind of recording apparatus, as long as we've got the equipment that is putting energy in and that is, so to speak, carving a recording yeah. electronically. It can then be played back, provided that we still have the equipment with which to do it. So it, it's no good recording a tape unless the other guy has got a tape player. Now, I think that energy of all kinds, whether it's heat or light or electricity, the things we learn about in physics and in science, um, that energy is what is needed in order to carve the track, to make the recording. And I believe also that the emotional energy that people experience if there has been, shall we say, a natural disaster like a fire or a flood, or when we hear reports from honest witnesses about phantom armies that are marching over an old battlefield centuries later, or the famous case in York where the young plumber saw a Roman legion go through the cellar of the treasurer's house and when they reached the hole that the plumber had dug in the centre to put in the new pipes, he could see their sandaled feet all the way up. But when they were on the other part of the cellar floor, he could only see them from just below the knees up. It was as if they were a recording of a Roman legion marching along a road 
that was now 18 inches lower than the, the floor of the cellar. And I think so many uh, recordings of that type uh, in North Norfolk. A number of honest witnesses have seen the, the black dog, whom they refer to as Old Shuck. And one postman who saw him on several occasions said, didn't realize it was Shuck the phantom dog until I looked closely and his paws were a good six inches off the road. He was trotting on a road that wasn't there now. And I think with the, with the case um, of the old lady in the house in Adamsdown, that what we were looking at was perhaps just a recording. She had sat in that room, perhaps she had been ill or lonely or frightened. Or perhaps she'd been happy that she'd seen something, she'd seen a friend coming to visit her, and the emotion she'd expressed had engraved the fabric of the building so that when those two young ladies who then lived there experienced it, it would be like going into a cinema and watching a film when the projector is running well and you are able to see it. And the medium who can see it clearly, mediums who can see it very frequently, naturally, I think they just have the right kind of mental equipment. They have the right kind of neuron patterns that enable them to detect these recordings. And I think in that one, so um, when you exorcise the building, something in the prayer of exorcism or in the, the power that the priest releases through the holy water or through the prayer cleans off the recording. You, you haven't got rid of an entity, it's just that you've unplugged the projector. Yeah, so you wouldn't say these are spirits that, that are trapped on this level, would you? This, this is something else? Well, no, there are. Yes, I, I think the recordings are just one category. Um, the idea of spirits that are trapped on a level I think very definitely also occurs. I was asked to go to uh, a house up in Cates where I had been teaching. I, I do a lot of private teaching. I'd been teaching uh, two of the sons of the house. Um, they were a devout Muslim family and it was a very happy family, which is important for what comes next. The lady and her husband, the parents of the children I taught, said that they were experiencing poltergeist phenomena, that they had asked their leader at the mosque to come and help them to disperse the phenomena, and that he had tried, but it was returning, and they'd had his permission to invoke the help of a Christian priest to see if that would make any difference and so with the uh, with the permission uh, of the uh, of their mosque authorities I went and uh, performed an exorcism and once again the phenomena returned sort of strange things were happening clothes and shoes from the wardrobe were turning up in the fridge or the oven food from the fridge was turning up in the wardrobe and underneath the carpet, there were some very strange sort of hieroglyphs, uh, almost like graffiti. But how on earth it had got there, no one knew. Now, because neither their priest nor I had succeeded in stopping it, we contacted Professor Santana, who is the recognized as the world authority on poltergeist phenomena. He brought with him a trusted medium friend, just as I always take Bremner with me, and his medium contacted the spirit of a nine-year-old girl who had died in the house a hundred years ago and who had been the daughter of very strict, um, very uh, demanding parents. And if this poor little kid had done any minor thing, well, if she'd come in, if she'd got her shoes wet, or if she'd come in with mud on her shoes, something 
very trivial that all kids do from time to time. The parents raved at her and said that she was a bad, wicked girl and would go to hell for her sins and messing up mummy's carpets and so on and so on, out of all proportion, totally ridiculous. And when she had died of TB, which this is what the spirit itself told the medium, when she herself had died of TB, she had been terrified to move on and had loitered in the house for a hundred years. What had caused the phenomenon was that she, still almost thinking of being earthbound, thinking that she was almost still alive, wanted to play and to be accepted by these happy, caring, loving parents which she had not had in life. And she was trying to attract attention by little mischievous things like putting food in the wardrobe or a shoe in the fridge. And the medium who was working under Professor Santana's um, guidance explained to the child that there was a wonderful world, rather like the idea of the spirits in Summerland, and had said to her, it's lovely, you don't have to stay here. If you go on, you'll find other children to play with and you'll have a lovely time. And she went on, and the phenomena ceased. Do you think that's a perfect example that, um, you know, whatever our thinking pattern is near the time of death, wh whether we do believe that we carry on, whether we do believe that we can still create when we carry on, do you think if you've been... Uh, traumatized in the sense that you know there, there's nowhere to go that you know once you reach death that that's it do you think your creation process then uh, goes to show in what you experienced at that particular time of death do, do you think that she was so stuck with, with where she was because she, she had no concept that um you know uh, that there is life after death i mean and that it's a, a good and beautiful and wonderful place she had what she'd had instilled into her was the thought of punishment and, uh, you know, a terrible place to go to, so you're safer hanging on here even if you're lonely. Yes, I think that the creative powers, that the ability of the human mind to govern what is going on around you... Um, let's think of a sporting situation. If you are determined that you're going to score that vital winning goal or you're going to kick for touch or you're going to get that vital penalty and get your team up to the next division. Um, it's particularly the case with um, martial arts competitions. I think more than whether, you know, whether you're boxing or wrestling or doing judo or kung fu, if you have that determination to win, it makes an enormous difference to your performance. Now, if we take that to um, the artist who's determined to paint a wonderful picture, or the musician who is going to compose something or to play something perfectly at the concert, if we magnify that, take it to its ultimate, and follow your concept, that belief in the world to come is so important that I have come across cases where the person who is terminally ill has been absolutely certain that there were loving relatives and friends who had gone ahead of him and who would come to get him and who would actually almost sit up on his deathbed and put his arms out as if to embrace an angelic or a, a loving relative who'd gone ahead of him. And in other cases, there is the, the bitter, frightened, unhappy person who regards life as a failure and the possibility of anything else as very remote will will die literally in abject misery. Now, I'm quite sure that the spirit does survive, even if there is abject, but it, it, it's making itself difficulties which it need not have experienced. It, it is, um, it's rather as if 
there's a wonderful world out there and it's rather as if we were going to walk through a beautiful natural landscape but the person who has told himself that there is no future that when i'm dead i'm done for it's as if he was stepping out from the earthly body with his eyes bandaged and his ears plugged and he will struggle into this world that he should if he could only rip off the blindfold and take out the earplugs that he could enjoy so much more quickly. I think that the enjoyment will come inevitably but it's going to take him an awful lot longer. During the time that he's earthbound because of this failure to accept the wonders that are coming that it will take him longer to get there. But, but why has no one come to collect these people? Now, that again, is a great question. I wonder whether when they are in that state have we ever come across cases in our ordinary mortal lives here where you or I have the best of intentions for a friend who has a problem. And we say, can I suggest to you that you do this? Or may I help you to do this? And you just reject it. No, I don't want any of that. And, you know, it's the poor guy who is, shall we say, he's run into some financial difficulties. And you say, look, George, don't be offended, but I can lend you a couple of hundred if you need it. I don't want your money. He needs it desperately, but there's something inside him that won't accept it. And I wonder whether the departing human spirit, the, the welcoming angels, the welcoming loved ones who've gone ahead, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, they've come to get him. But he won't let them because he has convinced himself that there's nobody there. And feeling a loving hand on his arm get off me, I don't want to, you know. Um, and I think that that negativization which we sometimes experience on earth when with the best will in the world we try to help someone, um, that may go, because I think that our, our natures, our, our characters will persist just as, as I said, my loving friend Bill well, Lionel, uh, where can people find out more on your on your work? Well, uh, if I may, I'd uh, like them to visit my website, where I've got a lot of it there, and that's World Wide Web, Lionel Fanthorpe, who's got to have a hyphen, <laughs> dot com. Or, um, if you just use, I find I can get there quickly if I just put Fanthorpe into a search engine and my website comes <laughs> up pretty quickly okay. and there's a list of all our book and uh, all the other things we do and there's also a piece of where Lionel is next and uh, that will tell them for instance I'm uh, lecturing in Swindon on Saturday and, uh, so it's uh, you know all sorts of places where I go to lecture uh, anybody does me the honour of coming to hear me they'll be very welcome Okay, well, look, we did, there's so many stories that we never got through. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to get you back on again. I'd be honoured to come back. You just tell me when you want me. Lionel, thank you so much. Real pleasure. To find out more information on Lionel Fanthorpe, go to lionel-fanthorpe.com or visit my site, themoreshow.co.uk and look up Lionel Fanthorpe under past guests. Well, until next time... Be safe. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests.
If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website.